ladies and gentlemen, officers, viewers. Welcome to East Gippsland Shire Council's meeting of today, the 15th of March, and an auspicious day, councillors, because the 15th of March is the Ides of March. And Shakespeare said, beware the Ides of March. So there we are. You can go and do some research on what the Ides of March are. East Gippsland Shire Council acknowledges the Gunai, Kurnai, Monero and Bidderwell people as the traditional custodians of this land that encompass East Gippsland Shire and their enduring relationship with country. The traditional custodians have cared and nurtured East Gippsland for tens of thousands of years. Council value their living culture and practices and their right to self-determination. Council pays, respects, pays respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in East Gippsland, their elders, past, present and future and emerging. East Gippsland Shire Council live streams, records and publishes its meetings via webcasting. We're doing that tonight. During the meeting, any members of the public who are addressing the council will have their images and contents recorded. No other person has the right to record council meetings unless approval has been granted by the chair. In line with the Local Government Act 2020, councils are able to attend council meetings electronically or in person and the meetings will be open to the public via live streaming. If council encounters technical difficulties with the live streaming during our meeting tonight, we will adjourn until the issue is resolved. If technical issues can't be resolved, the meeting may be postponed until a later date. And a member's attendance can only be recorded as present at a council meeting when the member can confirm they meet all of these criteria, if they're not here in person. They can hear the proceedings, they can see other members in attendance and can be seen by other members and they can be heard to speak. So now I'll, I will confirm with you, Councillor Buckley, that you can see and hear us. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Can you confirm that the location you are participating from is secure to ensure the confidential items are dealt with in a confidential manner? It is secure. Thank you, Mayor. Terrific. Thanks very much and welcome. We're glad that you're with us tonight. I'm moving on to the, our procedural matters now, councillors, and item 1.2, I don't think there's any apologies. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest, councillors or officers? None are noted. I will look around the room to make sure. Good, thank you. Confirmation of the minutes. So the minutes of the last council meeting held on the 2nd of February are concerned. Concerned, they aren't concerned, they're to be confirmed. So. Can someone confirm those? I have a, a mover, please. Thank you, Councillor Stowe, a seconder. Councillor Allen, did you want to speak to the minutes? Are they a true and accurate record? Councillor Allen? No, thank you. Anybody else like to speak to that, that the minutes are a true and accurate record? Thank you. I will confirm that and put that to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you, Councillors. The next meeting is scheduled for the 5th of April to be held at the Buchan Mechanics Hall, 45 Main Road, Buchan, commencing at 1.30 p.m. And I wonder when the last council meeting was held at Buchan, Mr CEO. Probably a long time ago, if ever. So that's fantastic. Requests for leave of absence. I haven't heard any. Have you? No, thank you. And we are now on to open forum where we can deal with petitions, questions of council and public submissions. And I believe we have a few tonight under the section 1.7.2 public questions, uh, CEO. So, Correct, Mayor. I'm happy to, to move into, um, we have eight people who are calling in tonight and I'm wondering if Mr. Love, Mr. Robert Love is with us. Not, not seen? He's coming now. Oh, good on you, Robert, thank you. Robert, looks like you're on mute. So yeah, you can should be. There, there you are, okay. Now, Robert, good evening, thank you. Welcome to the chamber. We've seen your question, and uh, there are two questions that you're asking, and I believe I just want to caution you about the nature of the second part of your question and your reference to that political regime, which I'm not comfortable with. So if you can rephrase how you ask that question, it would be helpful. 
Yes, Mayor, I've changed that. I got word of that earlier, so that's all good. Yeah, great, thank you. So we're, we're very happy about that and pleased and, uh, and we're glad for you to ask your question. You ready for me to go now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Good evening, councillors. My name is Robert. I am pro-choice concerning vaccination and believe in the sanctity of one's own body and the free will for people to choose whether they have a medical procedure or not under no mandates or coercion. I am unvaccinated. I can shop at Councillor Stowe's news agents. I can go to Bunnings and many other businesses. I used to be a member of the BARC for over 15 years, but because I am unvaccinated, I am no longer able to go to the BARC. What, my question is open to the floor to any councillor. Why are vaccine passports required in some venues but not others? So that's your first question. Do you have your second question, Robert, and then uh, we'll defer to an answer. You'd like the second question as well? Yep, sure. Do the East Gippsland Shire councils, councillors and council employees support a system of segregation and discrimination or do you all support diversity, inclusion and equality? If yes, how do you explain your current actions? Thanks, Robert. So I'm going to ask uh, Stuart to answer the question, if you would. Thanks, Mr McConnell. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. So the Victorian Government pandemic orders issued by the Minister for Health are lawful directions and set out the requirements for access to some community facilities, including some council facilities. And those orders are specific in terms of what applies to different facilities. East Gippsland Shire Council is obliged to follow the directions of the Victorian State Government and any concerns in relation to those directions should be directed to the Victorian Government. Great. Thanks, Robert. That's um, the response there. So thanks for your contribution tonight. Thank you for listening. Good on you. Uh, Councillor Buckley, this is um, a forum for um, uh, members of the community to ask questions. So, I just have a question, Mayor. The, the, uh, Robert did actually specifically ask councillors to respond to his question, yet he was responded to by an officer. So I'm just wondering um, whether it's possible to, to um, respond to his request as a councillor. Uh, look, I, I won't do that here tonight, and if Mr Love wants to make contact with individual account, individual councillors, he can make that, that uh, overture through the council uh, email, and councillors can respond individually. May I ask why? Uh, for the sake of expediency tonight, so I'm not going to go around the table and get each councillor to, to, um, to answer that question here tonight. So, Okay, thanks Robert. Thank you. The next question is from Ms. Tina Jenian. So, is Tina nearby? Eight people who are calling in tonight. There we are, and Tina. Good yeah. evening. Hello. Mark Reeves here. Welcome to the chamber. Hello, how are you? Very well, thanks. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you and we could see you there for a moment, but you've just disappeared. Oh, there. That's all right. There we are. Hello. G'day. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Tina Jenian. I live in Lindenau South. I am a primary school teacher and due to the vaccine mandate, I'm currently without a job. As a teacher, you're always telling the parents and the children, make sure you're reading at home or make sure you are enjoying what you're reading because learning to read is one of the most important parts of learning and growing up. The library is the place to get all the beautiful books to keep children engaged. The library is the place for young families to access story time and develop a love for reading. The library is the place for the older generation to access novels, history and further your knowledge. However, due to declining a medical procedure, which many were not able to give informed consent to, we are not allowed in the library anymore. What about keeping Victorians safe, especially around water? Young families and other people that choose, chose not to undergo this medical trial and, no, and are no longer allowed to access the swimming pool to practice swimming to keep themselves safe. 
The list goes on and on, as you would know. The unvaccinated are not allowed in the art gallery, the shire office, the school grounds, local dancers, even boating competition in the fresh air, cafes and restaurants. So, Tina, thank you for this your is, comments. Yes. Do you have a question of us, please? Yep, coming up to it right, right now. So, if you this could, please. This is unfair, unjust, unethical, goes against the Australian Constitution and must be stopped. Which brings me to my first question, dear councillors. The East Gippsland Shire Vision Statement, which is on the website and on the first page of tonight's agenda, states, East Gippsland, as an inclusive and innovative community that values our natural environment, puts community at the centre of council decision-making and creates the conditions in which communities can thrive. And your question, now Tina? Now my question is, yep. my question is, how are you fulfilling this vision statement when in reality, the Shire practices medical discrimination against its community. And your second question, so that we can answer them simultaneously. This brings me to another point. If the community would be So a question, please, a Tina. So more question, question and fewer points. Yeah, okay. The second question is in relation to your council plan 2021 to 2025, where in the strategic objective number five, you're stating that you are, quote, a transparent organisation that listens and delivers effective, engaging and responsive services, quote end, which we as the citizen voters of this Shire would like to see in action. Our question is, how is Council achieving its commitment to an inclusive and caring community when sections of our community are being discriminated against by being excluded from Council services? Thanks, so Tina. we, the citizens and voters of the East Gippsland Shire, would greatly appreciate a detailed answer on how you will achieve your vision statement, as well would like to see the scientific report from the state government why we are being discriminated against. Well, certainly we the science. Thanks, Tina. Tina. We'll, um, we'll move on to today. a response there, Tina. And certainly, okay, um, definitely um, you can certainly request a scientific report from the state government, and I urge you to do so. Right. But Mr McConnell in regard to inclusion and access. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. And as, as I previously stated, the Victorian government's pandemic orders issued by the Minister for Health are lawful directions and set out the requirements for access to some community facilities and therefore some council services, and that includes council facilities. Um, council is obliged to follow the directions of the Victorian state government. So any concerns about those directions um, are best directed to the Victorian Government. Thanks, Mr McConnell. Thanks, Tina. Sorry, it might not be the answer you require or re, um, desire, but um, as yeah. Mr McConnell said, following the directions are lawful directions of the Victorian Government. Thanks, Tina. Thanks for your contribution and lovely to meet you. Thank you. Likewise. I'll CEO, good evening. CEO, the third question is from Mr John Garden and Ms Margaret Noel. And you're going to read that. Correct, thank you. And the question reads, with all the new and proposed developments in the Eagle Point area, have any provisions been made to provide recreational facilities to cater to the growing population? Currently, there is a lack of facilities such as football, soccer, oval, basketball, netball courts, tennis court, skateboard park, etc., for use by the local community and families. The only sporting recreational facility we have is a tennis court, which is in dire need of an upgrade. And that ends the, the Great. Question. Well, thank you for that question regarding um, Eagle Point. And I think that Martin Richardson is there to assist with that. Oh, no, Mr McConnell again. Thank you. Good on you, Stuart. Thank you. So, through you, Mayor. Um, the provision of community and re recreational space in Eagle Point is addressed in the Eagle Point Structure Plan in Section 5.3. Um, there is, so that the provisions are there. There's informal recreation needs are going to be significantly enhanced with the development of the Eagle Point Foreshore Precinct. Yep. Um, with new playground, proposed upgrading and extension of path networks, etc. And Council is also undertaking some preliminary investigations in relation to the existing ten tennis court facility in Eagle Point with a view to um, providing some new facilities there for informal sporting activity. I would also note that football, cricket, tennis, bowls and skate park facilities are provided in both um, Painesville 
and Bairnsdale, which are in close proximity to Eagle Point. And currently there is councillors investing in a major new regional sporting facility for soccer, hockey and netball at the World Centre in Bairnsdale. Thanks, Mr McConnell, and indeed we are. And, uh, and that development at Eagle Point, I think all councillors are looking forward to seeing that to its conclusion. That's a really fantastic development. So thank you for that question, John and Margaret. Um, so uh, you're going to read the next question from Ruth Giles. Correct, thank you, Mayor. Question one. Would the council and developers revisit the proposed layout of the subdivision plan to find a way that does not have the entry exiting road infringing directly opposite mine and my neighbour's property backing onto Eagle Point Road? Please understand the impact to the residents facing the entry exit road will face with constant traffic noise of slowing and accelerating cars arriving and leaving the proposed east-west subdivision road. This also includes the intrusion of headlights shining directly into our properties. The second question reads, pertaining to the issue of the traffic flow affecting my property, why is it that Riley Street cannot be opened completely from Bay Road to Eagle Point Road intersects, intersecting with Woodman Road and putting in a roundabout at these intersecting roads? This would allow better traffic flow with the two entry exit roads onto Riley Street and the entry exit point at the lower end of the subdivision at Eagle Point Road. This would help to ease the funnelling of traffic directly aimed towards my property through the centre of the subdivision. That's the end Thank of the question. Thank you for reading that on behalf of Ruth and Mr McConnell. Is that you again? Yes. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. So the Eagle Point structure plan uh, sets out the preferred road network and the stands and alignments for this precinct that's subject to consideration later this evening. Um, that plan was informed by several years of community feedback and consultation, so it has been the subject of very significant consideration. One of the, one of the uh, goals of that plan was to design a road network which prevented the destruction of significant trees and especially in the western extent of Riley Street and the proposed layout does that. The area that's subject to consideration later this evening has also been zoned residential for some time and so um, it, is, it is noted that um, an entry point onto Eagle Point Road uh, would be expected as a result of that subdivision and the fact that it's been um, zoned as residential for some time is, is significant in that. There is clearly also the opportunity for screening and other things <coughs> to reduce the impact, but in, within an urban development um, and mm -hmm. a residential area, some impact from uh, intersections and traffic will be expected, um, but the, the impacts in this circumstance are assessed to be reasonable. Thanks, Stuart. Appreciate it. Thanks for the response. Um, Anthony, you have the next question on behalf of Mr Brett Tanyan. Thank you, Mayor. The preamble reads... I lodged an objection notice regarding planning permit for 27 Riley Street, Eagle Point. Due to the short notice, two days, I'm unable to attend this meeting. Hopefully a member of council can read the question on my behalf. Yep, which I'm there doing. you are. I understand I can ask two questions. Question one, what is the rationale behind the reasoning for the non-widening of the current Riley Street to accommodate the additional traffic flow and parking of additional vehicles from the subdivision? Question two, what steps have been considered to manage traffic flow and parking issues that will arise with the non-widening of Riley Street, Eagle Point? Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Anthony. And Stuart McConnell, you're going to take us on that journey as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor, and through <coughs> you. So, um, in respect of this matter, which again relates to the, the matter later on the, the agenda, um, the... Officer's recommendation includes a requirement in relation to the um, upgrade of roads as necessary in accordance with the in infrastructure design manual, which is the document that sets out the requirements for construction of, of different roads. So in relation to Riley Street and its assessment in terms of traffic carriage, etc., it sets out that there would be a minimum width of 5.5 metres and the expectation is that also that curb and channel would be provided 
uh, on the side of the road that's not currently does not currently have curb and channel. So there will be, um, as a result of uh, this development, if it's approved, some improvements to Riley Street. Great, thank you. That should be reassuring. And that matter will be dealt with later in the meeting as well, councillors and anybody who's listening, including um, Brett. The next question comes from Miss Cossett Murphy, and Miss Murphy is dialing in, I believe, so we may see Ms Murphy in a moment. There you are. And I suspect that's you with an ID beginning in 229. Is that you, Cossett? Your microphone's muted at the moment. Hello? Yep, we've got you now. Good evening. Hello, it's Cosette Murphy here. Yes, good evening, Cosette. So, Mark Reeves, the Mayor, you're you in, the, in the chamber with us at East Gippsland Shire. Uh, with a second, we just have a bit of technical. All right, I can see now. Can you see me, everybody? We've got you now. Good evening. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to talk with you. Um, I have two questions to ask. Thank you. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Cosette Murphy, and I used to work as a lifestyle and leisure at Maddox Gardens Aged Care Facility, part of Baines the Regional Health Service. I resigned due to adverse reaction from the flu injection that I had to have. These are the two questions I would like to ask you today. What does the East Gippsland Shire have to say to those Australian citizens especially the East Gippsylanders residents that have decided not to participate in a voluntary medical trial, but are then denied access to the East Gippsland Shire services and facilities that they contribute to via their rates and other Shire fees. Uh, question number two, do you think East Gippsland residents that are being discriminated against contrary to federal anti-discrimination legislation, which is still in place and enforceable in Australia, should continue to support the East Gippsland Shire financially via rates, fees, permits and licenses for services they cannot attend or access? If yes, what is your reasoning behind this? Thank you. Thank you, Cossett, and I'll defer to Mr McConnell around that matter. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. The Victorian Government pandemic orders are issued by the Minister for Health are, and they are lawful directions and they set out the requirements for access to some community facilities, including some council facilities and therefore some council services. East Gippsland Shire oh. Council is obliged to follow the directions of the Victorian State Government and any concerns in relation to these directions should be directed to the Victorian Government. Thanks, Mr McConnell. So, Cossett, the... Um, the actions and um, decisions based on the, the Shire and their facilities are the result of the legal directives from the state government. All right, thank you. So, so, so thanks for your I'm question. Going, if I'm going to sue Victorian government, will that be okay? You can contact the Victorian government. No, sue them for what they're doing to the people no. of Australia. So I would recommend that you make contact with the Victorian government about this matter because we're following the right. legal directives of the Victorian government. And these are, yeah. yep. Okay, they're the pandemic okay. pandemic uh, legislation. Right, okay, well, we'll uh, I will come back to that too then. Okay, thank, thank you. you so Councillor Buckley, I see you have a comment, but we have a couple of other people who are- no, uh, that's actually a question of, uh, of Mr. McConnell, if that's okay through you, Mayor. Uh, no, it's not at the moment, because we this is um, around uh, the citizens' com um, questions and public questions. So as a councillor, I'm not able to speak at this time. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's, it's about the public, but um, if you have a question of clarification, sure, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mr. McConnell, I just, my, my question is, is that um, all of the questions that have been presented uh, by the speakers today have been avoided by giving a a very blanket approach of the state directives and I feel that is there any way possible that we can respond to those questions in regards to 
uh, what they've asked because none of them have been answered correctly. So at the moment I'm chairing the meeting and from my perspective the questions have been answered, Councillor Buckley, in regard to the Council's response to the Victorian Government's pandemic legislation and we've followed the legal directives. And the, questions, the questions are formulaic and are asking the same thing. So I'm, I'm comfortable with the responses and I'm happy to move on. But thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmut Trackstork is dialing in and I believe he might have a question around Eagle Point. So thanks Cosset, thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening Helmut. You're on mute at the moment, but it's Mark Reeves here in the chamber with the councillors. Okay, can you hear me now? We can just hear you very faintly. I wonder if you can get close to a microphone. Maybe a bit closer at all, or? How was that? Very faint. We might need to um, project your voice a bit into that microphone. Okay, so um, just uh, bear with me because I I'm only just coming in cold. Aren't they, uh, are we at already the public forum? Yes, point, we or? are. We're ready to go, and we're at your disposal. So um, welcome. Okay. And thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Mark. Um, just uh, you've caught me on the hot side to quickly get my uh, thoughts here. That's Look, all right. Uh, take take your time and collect yourself, and we're ready to go when you are. Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you, um, uh, Mr Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to ask a, a question in tonight's open forum. Um, however, as some of you may already be aware, my question relates to a matter listed for discussion under item five in tonight's agenda, specifically item 5.2.1, relating to the planning permit application uh, lodged uh, earlier this year. Um, so I would ask for your guidance, uh, uh, Mr Mayor, if it would be more appropriate to raise my question when it would be deemed more appropriate to the topic, or do you wish me to table it now? N no. So this is, this is the right time and the right place for you, Helmut, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, just let me repeat the question. I, I have forwarded to councillors earlier today. Yes. Uh, I need to bring it up in front of me. Okay, so the question um, that I wish to raise or ask, uh, uh, and I'll just simply read it here. Given the lack of technical justification for proposing road connections into Riley Street in the application's traffic impact assessment, as well as the potential for shortcutting, that is through the estate, and the need to provide safer traffic calm routes to Eagle Point Primary School for vulnerable road users, that is children, Will councillors direct planning staff to replace proposed road connections to Riley Street in favour of cul-de-sacs with connecting footpaths as permitted by clause 12.3.4 of the Infrastructure Design Manual? Now that's the end of my question and I appreciate it's a, probably a technical uh, part technical, so hence I've forwarded some background information for councillors to consider. Yep. Are there any questions that uh, they may have of me to for further clarification? No, thank you. Councillors have seen your question and we're going to defer to Mr McConnell uh, to provide an answer for you this evening. So thanks, Helmut. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. So the road network proposed as part of uh, this subdivision that's for consideration later this evening is consistent with the Eagle Point structure plan and is not expected to give rise to significant shortcutting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Eagle Point Structure Plan sets out a preferred road network um, and alignments for this precinct and the plan was, the, was informed by several years of consultation and feedback from the community. Um, this included, as I mentioned earlier, the protection of significant trees, particularly in the western end of Riley Street. Um, one of the things I also note is the preferred standards for roadway construction provides for pedestrian footpaths along new roads and for, for additional linkages in public reserves, which is an improvement to the historical and current condition where there are minimal footpath links established. And um, Council will continue to implement the Eagle Point Structure Plan and provide additional link linkages in, in those areas. A structure plan uh, adopted by Council supersedes 
any of the IDM or requirements to the extent there's any inconsistency. The suggestion that's been provided would be an option, but it's not um, what has been settled with the community through several years of work in the Eagle Point structure plan consultation process, and so it's not the preferred um, layout for implementation. Thank you. Uh, do I have an opportunity to respond? Uh, no, not at this stage, Helmut. So we've had a response and um, we're comfortable with that. So the matter will be dealt with later in the evening and uh, we certainly welcome you to, to um, stay around and see what the outcome is of that, that decision later. Uh, okay, I appreciate so. Um, will I be able to hear the rest of the meeting now or will I be left out of the loop until that point arises? So you won't be in this meeting room, but you can watch the meeting from um, East Gippsland Shire YouTube TV, I think it is. So you can watch it from there. OK. Um, and if I may take the liberty of just flagging to the councillors that in terms of the background information, um, I think it is, uh, uh, dare I say, uh, very important for them to take note of the request because for the future of the Eagle Point community, it would be a shame if we uh, were not to allow the, um, the proposal uh, or my proposal to proceed. Thank you very much. Good on your helmet. Thank you. And uh, councillors are quite invested in this decision and many were at the PCM, the, the uh, planning consultation meeting around this and uh, have taken particular pains to go and visit the site as well. So mm -hmm. thanks for your contribution and, and uh, what you've provided us. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Good thanks, on you. Councillor. Good evening. Thank you. Councillors, our last... Uh, contribution tonight and public question is from Mr. Shane Kidd and Shane is dialing in and there he is. Good evening Shane. You're in the Good chamber. Evening. It's Mark Reeves here with the councillors. Uh, hi. G'day. Hi. Sorry the YouTube channel's out of sync with this. It is just um, a bit out of sync so don't play them <laughs> yeah, simultaneously. Yeah. You'll hear yourself in a minute or so. Okay, yes, okay. I'll just get my questions up or my screen's just changed. Uh, yeah, good evening and thank you for having me. Good on you. Uh, my name is Shane Kidd. I've run many businesses in Lake Entrance for 20 years, been president of the local Chamber of Commerce on several occasions and a member of the local Rotary Club. My questions regarding the dis discriminating practices of the East Gippsland Shire are directed to the Shire Mayor and the councillors and not the state government. I would appreciate if the mayor or a councillor who have implemented, implemented the discrimination can please make available the pandemic orders they are following. So, question one. On what legislation and medical data does the East Gippsland Shire councillors base their decision to medically discriminate against Australian citizens and visitors to this region? Please, can you please provide instructions, legislation and the medical evidence given to the Shire by the state and federal governments that support the East Gippsland Shire's discriminatory actions. Question two. What additional funding, if any, does the East Gippsland Shire receive from the state and or federal governments to enforce and encourage discriminatory practices connected to the East Gippsland Shire's ability to provide facilities and services to Australian citizens? Do we receive any? Sorry about Thanks. that. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. So I'll defer again to Mr McConnell. It's probably not the answer that you require, but um, basically East Gippsland Shire implements the legal directives of the state government under pandemic legislation, and that's our requirement. And I would like you to be able to produce that to the residents of East Gippsland. So that, that legislation is available orders. on the state government website. We, we don't necessarily provide that. We just act on the direct legal directives under the Victorian Constitution. But I will provide, I will ask Mr McConnell to provide a response. And, uh, and in terms of your second question, uh, we don't receive any, any uh, additional funding to do what you allege we're doing. So, Mr McConnell. So, thank, thank you, Mayor. And just to confirm, yes, the Victorian Government pandemic orders issued by the Minister for Health are lawful directions. They set out the requirements for access to community facilities and including some council facilities and council is obliged to follow those directions of the state government and so any concerns uh, should be directed to the Victorian government in relation to those and as you rightly indicated the orders, um, those le legally um, 
uh, lawful directions in those orders are available on the Department of Health uh, website and we can point um, Mr Kidd to those if necessary. Yep. I'm, I'm not requesting the orders from the uh, website. I'm requesting the orders that were obviously sent to the East Gippsland Shire. There must be paperwork. There must be a paperwork no. trail of these demands. So, so this is not a debate, Shane. So we're, we're actually just following the directives from from the state government and those directives are from issued... A, from a website. From a website. Issued... Well, where, wherever they're yeah, issued from, they are issued and they are legal directives. So... But, and we're but, obliged but to follow I'm them. So I'm do requesting... Do I have to do a freedom of information request on the East Gippsland Shire to sure, get the Sure, you, 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 you may do that and, uh, and I encourage anyone and we certainly encourage anyone who wishes to do that. But the directives are the legal directives from the state government and that's where they are and they apply to this shire and every shire in Victoria. Shane, thank you for your contribution tonight and thank you for your work in Lakes Entrance. We know it's been a long journey that you've been on. Thank you, Mark. Good on you, Shane. Same to you. All the best. Questions weren't answered. Um, CEO, we have a public submission as well now. Mark. Yes, go ahead, Kirsten. Can I just ask something for clarification? Go ahead. In these meetings when the community comes to speak with us, is it... Are only the officers that are allowed to answer? Like Councillors can ask a question of clarification. Okay. Yep. So we can't make any comments? Because I feel like in the past we have, when people have come in. I feel like we've, I just want to clarify what is our... Sure, stand by. So I've just got a clarification from the governance officer. Um, so there is nothing in the governance rules that prevent a councillor yep. um, from um, answering a question. Yep. If they, if they choose to do so. Um, there is certainly quite clear um, directions or, or uh, rules in the governance area, that, in the governance rules that go to the fact that it's not a discussion or debate, uh, this part of the questions. Yeah. This is different to when a community group present to council, where there is that uh, interaction and question. Um, However, the rules are clear that councillors may ask a question of clarification of an attendee if they wish to. Okay. All right, so if you didn't have that opportunity, my sincere apologies. Oh, no, it's okay. I just felt like the responses were really repetitive and I think it, at the end of the day, this is more the, a statement. The questions were repetitive too. The questions were repetitive, but I, I think we probably should hear their voices a little bit more. Um, but maybe that's... a. a a different time that I bring that up. Yep. But everyone that just presented had a very valid point in terms of accessing council services. Yep. And now that the majority of people are vaccinated in Victoria, I think maybe we could play a role in ending those mandates for our community. So they're just my thoughts. And that'll be a decision from the state government and the chief health officer about those mandates and decisions, because that's the, the lawful directive. I do agree. Yep. But I think we have a role of, to play in advocacy. Yep. And, and, pr and protecting our community. I, you know, I'm yeah. not against the vaccination. I just, I do feel really sorry for these people who miss out in our community. Yep. Very good. Councillor Buckley, before we go on to our public submission. Yeah, look, I, I'd like to s support Councillor Van Diggle's comments, but uh, I, do, I do feel that um, as a councillor, councillor that we should be allowed to express our concerns for our community when they are voicing their questions towards us and I feel I haven't been able to be afforded that opportunity today which is incredibly disappointing and I would also like to encourage other councillors to take seriously that people are hurting in our community and feeling disenfranchised and it's unfair and I know that these are state directives but there are other councils in that are, are resisting against these mandates and I believe we have a, a, a stronger role where we can we can also have our voice um, of you know heard at a state level and I would in, would like to engage councillors in the future in finishing up that we write to the premier to express that there is a section of our community that are feeling disenfranchised disengaged and also they are ratepayers and they they okay. are being right. excluded so we, that's, a, that's a matter that we can put to council at some stage with a view that 95 or 96% of, the, of our shire are double and triple vaccinated. So councillors, 
We are going to ask uh, Scott Lambshed and Cathy McClellan to join us. I hope they can. And they have a public submission and they are representing the Sarsfield Community Association. And good to see you, Scott and Cathy. And it's a shame we're seeing you under these circumstances, but uh, welcome to the Chamber. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, councillors, and thank you, Cathy, for coming along as well. Um, I'm no longer the Vice President, so I'm, I'm, I'm being recycled as a standard member now. I just want to give the Council a brief update, if I could, on uh, the state of play, I suppose, in the Sarsfield community, and especially with regards to the recent round of Black Summer Bushfire Grants and the NRAA. Um, no doubt you've seen our efforts to try and keep this in the media to some extent. We uh, put in a huge amount of work as uh, both the Hall Committee and the Sarsfield Community Association, which is the CRC, to prepare um, a community plan, a substantial and exhaustive community plan, along the guidelines that BRV provided us. Um, it's a pretty good plan, um, and I'd encourage any member of council or staff to have a look if you haven't familiarised yourself with it. It's on our sarsfield.com.au website. Uh, we studied the BR, uh, sorry, the NRAA grant guidelines extensively. We submitted our grants um, in partnership with the Hall Committee. And there's no doubt you will have heard that we were, it was pretty much put in the bin because they looked up our ABN and said, oh, that's a state government organisation, we don't qualify. Um, we've since received independent legal advice that that, that is erroneous. Um, there wasn't any specific um, documentation around ABNs being an issue that might eliminate a community group. This has also happened to Wairia, NSA, Buchan and quite a few other community groups in the other parts of Victoria. We're working very hard with Darren Chester and uh, other uh, local members and yourselves to try to have this uh, decision reviewed. Uh, we, we, we accept that things were um, evaluated on their merit and the grants were issued. However, we would request that we have that opportunity to be evaluated on our merit, which did not take place. Um, so I suppose what we're asking for as a community is for um, strong support from our council and councillors and we certainly get strong support from Stuart McConnell and his wonderful team and our fabulous place manager who I would clone tomorrow. I'd have 50 cats if I could. Um, it, it's really just us saying, hey, we're out here, we as a very small dedicated group of people who are getting a little bit frazzled. We're working at 145% to try and agitate to have this turned around and really wanted to just have that opportunity to, to brief the council on that and see if they had any questions. Yeah, Scott, look, thanks so much. And um, we really hear you and nothing sustainable at 140%. Something will blow at some stage if you keep going at that speed. Um, it's, it's something that really concerns the councillors. There's no doubt about that, and uh, and we certainly had um, Darren Chester with us in the chamber last week, and we spoke to these points and around your travails very specifically, and uh, and I think that that message was conveyed uh, from the councillors to Darren, and that was then conveyed from Darren to where it needs to be conveyed. But I will defer to who, who's going to respond for us. Is Stuart going to? Uh, Is there any? Minutes. Yeah. It's, um... And this isn't a question, this no. is a presentation from, yep. from this fabulous community group yep. who are absolutely no, right. working as hard as they can they in are. their community. So it's an opportunity to ask questions of this group uh, or to seek some clarification, yep. but it's, it's Good. an opportunity for them to talk to us about the issues and obviously the Black Summer Grants issue is the, is the pinnacle one it at is. the moment. It's um, sort of representative of everything that's going wrong at the minute and um, Scott, thanks for, for coming here and, and sharing that with us. Councillors, are there any questions or comments or observations? Yeah, Arthur, Arthur Allen, Deputy Mayor, Scott. Thanks, Mark. Um, Scott, what can we do? How can we be most effective in, in uh, pushing your cause? I think, Councillor Allen, that, that uh, from a Shire point of view, that the, the, the Shire team has been incredibly helpful and has supported us right through this process with advice and so forth. However, I know that our councillors are very active in the community probably have their ear to the ground somewhat more than we do when it comes to potential opportunities that the community may take advantage of. Um, and I think also 
if the opportunity to provide support to those communities, and not just us, I'm, I'm hurting for Wairiwa and SA and Bucken, Bucken got hammered like Sarsfield did. Mm. I think um, if, if you're in those areas and you're meeting Bucken soon, just say to them, guys, we're with you, we understand, uh, because it, you do feel a little bit at sea when you're trying. We're, we're taking on the big boys here. The NRAA are just saying, it's you, not us. So it, it takes quite a lot of gumption as individuals and as an organisation to you know, take take them to the task, which is exactly what we're doing at the moment. Yep. So I'm not sure if Cathy would have anything to add to that. She's got a different perspective. I would just really ask if you, if you've got a phone line to Scott Morrison or anyone in senior, please use it. Just ask them to have another look at this or find another bucket of money or something because it's really devastated us. That's all. It's really, you don't know where to go. Yeah, no, thanks, yeah. Cathy. It's... That's difficult, and thanks for the question, Arthur. Yeah, and thank you, and uh, I'll do everything I can, and I think I speak for everyone in the chamber and out of the chamber that uh, you've got our support, and uh, wherever we run into anyone of any influence, uh, we'll blow the trumpet. Thank you, we, we really appreciate it. On behalf of the Thanks, there's thank a couple, couple of the councillors have some questions or comments, and I was looking at Councillor White, who I thought had a, a phone number of the Prime Minister, that's why I looked across to him. <laughs> and I'll ask him if he still does. But then Councillor Van Deegle and Councillor Greeson both have questions or comments. No, <clears throat> sorry about that. My, my direct line is to actually Dan Andrews. Oh, that's I'm afraid right. he <laughs> may not be able to support you in this. But first, Scott and Cathy, um, as you might remember, I was the mayor when the bushfires occurred. And many times um, in, in talks with government, I felt that uh, many sectors of our community were being shortchanged. There's a, there's a massive bucket of money in the funds and it was just at every opportunity, and I, I mean, you are tired, you said you're working at you know, one and a half capacity and you can't keep doing that forever, no. but um, every time I had an opportunity to speak with somebody who I thought was in a position could, who could change decisions, I just, I annoyed them. I, I advocated for the, the sectors of our community that I thought were being shortchanged and eventually persistence, and that's probably the key word, persistence, and, and we would support you 145% to, to, to get what you are asking for because you deserve it. And as I said, persistence, that's the key word, just at every chance. and. And as the Mayor's just mentioned, we have um, spoken personally with, with, um, with our local member to take it back, to, to, for Darren Chester to take this back to Canberra because he's got a, he's got a direct line with these ministers and, the, and, of course, the Prime Minister. So if, and he is on your side. Don't, don't uh, forget that he is on your side. And I would just say that uh, you know, you've, you've had a terrible shock, um, but it's there is still time and persistence will get you over the line. And I, I would just say as a group here, as councillors for East Gippsland, we support you and the other communities who have missed out because as you are well aware, there was money went to other places um, in larger amounts than what you were asking for and you scratch your head and wonder why because they weren't burned out. And, um, you know, We'll, we'll just keep pushing and advocating for you and hopefully Darren Chester can come through and perhaps in not much, you know, too, too far down the track that we can get the things that you want. Yeah, thanks, John. Good words, well spoken. Kirsten? It's kind of hard to beat what John just said, but hello, Scott and Cathy. Um, I don't have a direct line to anyone, <laughs> so I'm not much of a help myself, but... Um, I did actually uh, message Tiana a few days ago to ask um, how much was applied for and what was in the um, funding application. And she said, uh, the full hall rebuild, a nature-based playground, walking track plus parking, new toilets, multi-purpose courts, parking drainage, and all the other stuff in between um, for 3.6 million. I know that's obviously what you're advocating for, but if you were to receive like 
$1 million worth of funding? Would there be certain projects you would work on? Because it's nice to try to apply for the whole 3.6, but now, given the money's already allocated, if there's smaller pockets of money available, would you prioritise sections to get that done? Yeah, good question. Thanks, Kirsten. Cathy, you were Yes, uh, in a way, we are um, working backwards. So we're using every the very um, valuable East Gippsland Foundation and bushfire recovery grants to apply for everything else but the hall, because the hall itself is 2.6 million to rebuild. Possibly if we um, were able to get, um, what's the word, re some revamping of our design, it could be a bit less or have an option because a fair hunk of that, quite an amazing amount to me, about 300,000 is actually for parking that's required when you start building a hall. Um, but you actually need closer, I would think, you need something around the order of $2 million to build a reasonable modern hall, where at the moment, um, looking at getting a business plan done for the hall itself so that there's, um, as I guess what you'd call a business case for and how it would be used in a community and what money it would earn if it was a certain size, sort of um, crystal ball gazing. But yes, we're, we've, if you like, we're nibbling around the edges of our playground, well, all being well with some of these grants we're going for in the next month. Um, we've, we're working on the toilet rebuilds and things like that, but the hall itself is the big ticket item and it's going to need a fair bucket of money to do properly. Thanks, Cathy. The Buck and Pub came to mind for me with the crowdfunding, like the GoFundMe. Yes, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a plaque on the wall in Buck and Pub. So. Mm. <laughs> But that was crowdfunded years ago, so it was. maybe setting up a GoFundMe account, something different. Just came you have, shouldn't mind. have to. I know you shouldn't have to. Shouldn't have to. No, you shouldn't have to. But if now I, the technicality can't be fixed. Yeah. I, th I know that the numbers seem huge when you're starting to talk two plus million dollars for a hall, but um, the, the minute you go to a commercial construction, it, it just it goes gangbusters. The costs, and as Cass said, there's parking, dis disabled access all abilities, toilets, um, you go into this whole new realm of, whereas the current halls, the old kiosk from Eagle Point, the old multi-purpose room from the school, and then a bit in between that the TAFE built. So it was, you'd never be able to get away with it these days, unfortunately. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, Scott, and we, we sometimes um, despair at the eye-watering cost of public infrastructure. Mm. Um, it's, we're well and truly uh, across it at the moment, unfortunately. Councillor Greeson, Jane, did you have a question? Hi, um, Scott and Cathy, thank you for coming to talk to us. I'm really pleased that you have. Um, we were horrified that your application was rejected given what you've been through. Um, it's just appalling. And I, I think you've sort of answered my questions in talking to Kirsten here, but um, the, one, the one question I would ask of you is, what feedback have you had from the department um, after the rejection of your application? and have they given any indication that they might review or look again or try and f help you in other ways? As far as I'm aware, Councillor, that we... And, um, unfortunately, the President's on holidays this week, so... But as of the weekend, um, we had not had a formal response from the NRAA. Um, as an individual, I've, I did write to them, as did many other community members, and we got a, an automated reply and then a form letter about three days later. But I'm not aware, unless Kat's heard something, that they've actually responded to us as an organisation in the meantime. No. I'm shocked by that. That's appalling. Jane, and, isn't it? They, and their letter just said, the form letter just said, you failed because you didn't do the job properly because you should have known that that ABN meant that it was a state en entity and that a Obviously, a hall committee is a state entity, and anyone knows that. 
and everyone knows their ABN off by heart and what it does when it actually goes into an application. And it's just, and it's the ironic thing from our point of view is it's almost, we we were in the meeting because both committees were like overlap and they're the, involved and we're like, who's going to be the main applicant for this? Hmm. And it was almost like that politeness, you know, you have, well, the SCA has probably done the bulk of the work as a committee in all of this, but the hall committee runs the hall and if you're going to build a new hall, it would seem rude to not put the hall committee in as the primary applicant. Yeah. And it really swung on being polite at the time, not, not that there was any dissension, but it was like, that seems like the right thing, polite thing to do. The hall committee should be the lead applicant. We'll support it. East Gippsland Shire, East Gippsland Shire could have been the lead applicant. That was mm. even thrown around by the grant writer. And either of the other options would have at least got our application heard. And we believe if they'd heard it, that would have been successful, but that's just our... I couldn't. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's, I think I think the key the key thing is that um, it's not so much that we got rejected. And have have we been considered based on merit and been rejected? We were prepared for that uh, because that happens when you, you know, it was oversubscribed substantially. It's just the fact that they didn't even bother reading it past the first page that's really knocked us for six. Um, it seems like a very unfair front filter, um, Scott. That um, just flicked a whole lot of people. And a whole lot of organisations straight out of the equation, yes. um, I, straight away. Look, we're going to have to move on, councillors. Yes, so, sorry. So Jane so much time. and then John. Yeah, no, just very quickly. I'm just wondering whether we, as a council, ha have written to them expressing our concerns about mm, it. It's a good point. I was just saying to the CEO that maybe we need to write to yeah. um, Bridget McKenzie's office and do some advocacy, and we, we can certainly do that, Scott and Cathy. That would be fabulous. We've pulled out the the big, the big guns and got the president of the CWA to write to them. CWA, absolutely. That would make anybody shake in their boots, most yep. definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, John? Thanks, Jane. This was something that uh, happened about five years ago out at Lindeno, and um, I know that Sarsfield is a vibrant and growing community. If you were to be successful in not enough money, I'm sure that in your community and probably on your committees, you actually have... Um, tradespeople, electricians, plumbers, etc. that you know of. And at Lindeno, they, they got a grant to do some hall upgrades and and half of that was done in kind. In kind, yep. In kind by the community who were qualified tradespeople. So in other words, the electrician could sign off on the work done to say it was you know certified, satisfactory, etc. as any other of the tradespeople could do. So... You know, if you did come by some money, you may be able to put a proposal through, probably through council, to uh, to maybe get get started. But uh, you know, and you're obviously all working tirelessly to to improve your situation there. So I'm sure that those tradespeople that live in your community would probably be more than happy to assist, and that would uh, you know could get the job done at half price. Yes, I yep. think it's definitely worth considering. Good points, John. And, um, certainly don't want to overburden the community, but um, there's a lot of generosity out there. Trevor, did you have a quick question or? Okay. Scott and Kathy, thanks, thanks for joining us tonight. And um, there's a, a lot of uh, empathy and perhaps misunderstanding on our behalf. We don't understand, just like you, about how, how we got this wrong. Um, but we will do whatever we can with Boyle Oceans. And uh, yeah, I think you have. Uh, a lot of support from this council group, and I think in at, at least one thing, we will we will certainly write to the minister, uh, minister's office, and uh, we'll craft some something around that to see if we can get a, a please explain. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Okay, councillors. Thank you. Good night. Right. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Yeah. You too. Bye now. Thanks. Bye. How are we going, councillors? We right to move on to the next item. And this is a notice of motion. And Councillor Yuri, we're well, pleased to see this notice of motion. Would you like to tell us what your motion is and see if you get a seconder and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> so I would like to move 
that council officers be asked to light the East Gippsland Shire Council Corporate Centre building at 273 Main Street, Bensdale, in the colours of the Ukrainian flag, that is blue and yellow, each evening and night for a period of one week. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Fantastic. Is there a seconder for this motion? Councillor <coughs> Crook, good on you, thank you. Councillor Mendy, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. So, um, the rationale for um, putting this motion to the Council is um, that East Gippsland Shire Council wishes to make a public and heartfelt gesture of care and concern for the people of Ukraine, whose country is currently subject to invading and hostile forces, whose lives and livelihoods, homes and communities they know and love are being deliberately demolished. By this small gesture of lighting up the corporate centre in blue and yellow, we join with many others around the globe to say that the people of East Gippsland are thinking of the people in Ukraine and holding them in our hearts. So, councillors, as we know, on the 24th of February, the invasion of Ukraine began. So that's nearly three weeks ago. And we around this table, I believe, fully understand the value of one bridge and one road. We put a lot of effort into what is really the business of council, and that is to provide services, to build and manage assets, to promote in our communities health, well-being, connection and safety. In short, the conditions in which communities can thrive not just for ourselves, but for future generations. To witness through media reports and interviews with people on the ground in Ukraine is heartbreaking, what is happening there. The deliberate targeting and destruction, not just of human life, but of critical infrastructure, roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, and it goes on. The resulting devastation is beyond imagination. And it's not just to physical infrastructure, but to people and livelihoods of people and community and all things which they love and hold dear. Councillors, in cities across the globe, um, as a simple measure of drawing attention and displaying uh, care for the people of Ukraine, public buildings have been lit in blue and yellow to show support. People might ask if it makes any difference. Well, I've seen many interviews in the media of people in, with people in Ukraine, and they actually say that it does make a difference. When we were in trouble in the midst of the terrible, terrible black summer bushfires in East Gippsland, I believe messages of support from across the world did make a difference to us. So, councillors, I ask you to please support this motion. Thanks, Councillor Yuri. The second I'd like to speak to the motion. Briefly, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, we've all seen the images on our televisions. I won't try and describe the atrocities that are occurring, but I feel with real conviction that it's just almost beyond words. Um, this is an egregious act of aggression and violence directed in large part against innocent civilians and people who are doing their best to take up arms against a brutal dictator. It's a small but symbolic gesture for us to light our building here, but I think it's the right thing to do because it shows that we're aware and that we care, and that we're prepared to stand with the innocent victims of war to say that what's happening is wrong and that we can do better. I don't think there's anything more I can say. Thanks, Councillor Crook. Councillors, is the motion opposed? Would anybody else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Stowe. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it was my intention to vote against this motion. Um, philosophically, I don't believe that we should be getting involved in international affairs and none of our business. 
But having just listened to um, Councillor Mendy speak passionately about it, I have to say that I've changed my mind, I'm going to vote for it. Fantastic, good for you. Good for you. Can any other councillors like to speak for or against the motion? Councillor Van Diggel. Councillor Buckley, pardon me, go ahead. Uh, yes, look, I, I'm, agree um, I'm against all aggressive nations and a conscientious subjector to war. However, the reason why I will abstain from this vote is due purely to it not being a local council matter. And we must ensure that we're not spending ratepayers' money on, on matters that we cannot have an effect on. This is a world matter and it shouldn't be used for political grandstanding as much as we our hearts go out to the people affected by what's happening. I think we should steer our course directly on what is a local council matters, not, not world matters. So I'll abstain from this vote. Thanks, Councillor Buckley. Councillor Van Diggle. Um, surprisingly, I was actually also going to vote against it, which initially I wouldn't have thought that I would do. But I looked up some statistics just then as well. I'm going to vote for it, so I know I probably shouldn't say how I'm going to vote, but there's also a war going on in Yemen, and I've just had a look. 100,000 people have been killed, including 12,000 civilians, um, and 85,000 dead as a result of an ongoing famine. So I will vote in support of, but I think you know, we should look, be looking at the countries that are not just Western countries in this case. Um, I'd be even open to seeing if there's anything else we can do in terms of a light show, um, showing that we're not in support of war and violence. Um, because I do feel for the people of Ukraine, I've been watching it, I read articles right before I go to bed, I understand how important it is. And it feels so much closer to home. You know, I was born in Europe and my family feel like it's very close by. But there is so much war and conflict in this world, not just in the Ukraine. So I'd be interested to... I'm going to support it, but I'd be interested to see how, how else we could advocate for those communities um, that no one seems to speak about. Um, and also, <coughs> if there can be a light show at the council, does that mean we can look at having a light show on the water tower? It's a different topic, but... The water tower's not ours. I know, but I got told they weren't allowed to have lights because it's dangerous. Cars. So. Thanks. That's a, another excellent debate for another day, I suspect. Councillor Allen. Uh, I'll vote in favour of this motion. Uh, some two or three weeks ago, on Netflix of all places, mm -hmm. I watched a documentary on the, nine, uh, the 2014 uprising in Ukraine yeah. where... Ordinary people, unarmed, for a hundred days, fronted armed militia, uh, secret police, and police. Hundreds were shot dead because they value their freedom. And again, if you see the uh, vision that's available on social media and everywhere else, there are unarmed people standing in front of tanks, mm -hmm. uh, confronting Russian soldiers. Uh, this is only a token, but. I just admire their courage and their commitment to their freedom. And I think we should be uh, applauding them and supporting them to having the courage to do it. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Allen. Councillors, any other comments? Councillor Greeson. Um, I just want to say I think it's a no-brainer that we indicate our support for these people. Thank you. Thanks, councillors. Well, my humble contribution would be that uh, I think it's a small cost and we have uh, explored that it's only a few hundred dollars to actually um, install the lights or run them for that week, which is a, sm a small investment. And if anybody asks me, you know, what, how do you put your money where your mouth is, um, it's a fair question, you know, that we feel so helpless in these situations, these countries so far away. And if anybody asks me, well, I support Medicine Sans Frontieres and UNICEF, they're our chosen international charities, and uh, this is a reminder that those um, members of the community might ask, what are those councillors doing? And if they ask me, that's a simple and humble thing that I might be able to respond to that raises that awareness. Um, we've got to do anything we can to oppose despots like um, what's happening against our cousins in Ukraine. It's terrible. Thanks, councillors. Thank you, Councillor Yuri, for bringing that to us. And I'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? 
eight in favour and one abstinence, I believe. Thanks, Councillor Buckley. Thank you, councillors. Let's move on to the next item. And that is deferred business. I don't think there's anything of that. Councillor and delegates reports. Councillors, you've been busy, but there's a challenge for you to keep your reports brief and succinct. <laughs> Councillor Allen, would you like to start? In dot points. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, look, along with uh, Mark and Mindy, I had a great day at Tambo Bluff Landcare uh, a few weeks ago, and I'll let them talk about that. But uh, just to say that I really appreciate the work that that land care group are doing and uh, the hospitality that they afforded us uh, for that morning in the mist. It was really good. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to mention the Orcra uh, annual general meeting and community dinner that I attended along with Stuart and uh, McConnell and Helen Shield and uh, pass on my congratulations to Jane Rowe and her committee for the great work that they're doing there and also uh, just to pass on to the comments that were coming from people about the great work that Helen's doing as the uh, place manager or officer or whatever she is. Apodomio. Apodomio, great. yeah. Uh, the uh, one other thing I, I'll mention quickly is that uh, I attended along with uh, Mark the Community Youth Forum uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago and I forgot to write down Kiara's surname but I congratulate her mm -hmm. on her election to the position of chairman. Uh, she was a very, very impressive young woman uh, who I think will do a great job leading that group. And the final thing I'd like to uh, mention qu quickly is that a no, long-time resident of Nungurna, Ray Kleinitz, was recognised for 60 years of service to the CFA only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's a fantastic achievement and uh, Ray has been someone who has been community first all his life and uh, it was great to see that that recognition was afforded to him in his latter years. Good on you. Thanks, Councillor Allen. Councillor Crook. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll keep this brief. Um, I had a great time at the Orbost show yesterday. Fantastic event. So my congratulations to the Orbost Agricultural Society for, for pulling that one together and especially the Far East Gippsland Landcare Network for the Sustainable Living Festival. We had Costa from Gardening Australia and all sorts of... There were literally dozens of community organisations participating. Um, and what at one stage looked like hundreds of people on a beautiful day. So, well done. Um, and I'll just give a quick plug to this week's Regional Nature Based Tourism Forum, which our Shire is hosting in now an hour. Um, I'm not sure if you can still participate or get tickets if you haven't, but um, I'd encourage you to look at the Council's website um, to see if that's possible. It's a really exciting area, um, and I'm really looking forward to being there this week. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Councillor Stowe. Oh. Mayor, look, if you'll indulge me, I've done nothing spectacular the last three weeks since the usual Monday and stuff, but I'd just like to mention tomorrow um, the group of us, three councillors and um, the general manager are going up to Omeo. We're going to um, speak to some of the ratepayers up there and visit some of our assets up there. Uh, and um, this is great that the councillor group, and Tom just illustrated going to the Orbos show, we're, get, we're the second biggest shire area-wise in Victoria, and we're getting out and about into some of the areas where we don't have council representation, uh, like Orbos. So um, I'd encourage all councillors to continue to do this. I think this is terrific, and we look forward to getting up to Omeo tomorrow. Thanks, Trevor. And just a quick reminder to you that councillors are busy and they're out doing things, and sometimes it seems mundane, but doing it over and over again is what makes you visible in the community. So don't underestimate that. Councillor Greeson. Okay. Oops, thank you. Oh, my notes just disappeared. <laughs> um, I attended a workshop for the MAV Emergency Management Board Advisory Committee, um, which started with a presentation from Andrew Hayward from the Bushfire Recovery Victoria. 
and I learned a bit about that organisation. It was established in January 2020 to support recovery from the bushfires. Then in June 2021, it was expanded to include floods and storms. It was consolidated in October 2021 to have responsibility for, for recovery from all emergencies. And this year it is transitioning to be responsible for an as to be to have responsibility to be an all hazards recovery entity. Um, so it, it's a complex organisation. It's had responsibility for eight hundred and thirty four million dollars so far, um, and it does things like coordinating short term modular housing, seventy three of them, and doing clean up around the place. So it's it's. Um, it's a very rapidly evolving organisation with a lot of responsibility. After this, the MAV's draft policy paper was workshopped, which talks about the evolving role of local government in this area. So it talks about the changing legislation and revised emergency planning arrangements and the significant complexity for councils and the sector. Um, and uh, um, the discussion was mainly around the role of local government, the engagement of communities, the importance of local knowledge during emergencies and during recovery. And, and this is considered to be of paramount importance. Most of the councillors um, spoke to that. So it's clearly an important area of responsibility for local government. It needs a lot more work to develop appropriate engagement with state government and the emergency management agencies. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Councillor Van Diggle. Thank you. Um, I've attended a a couple of things, but I'll, I'll just talk about the Omeo Region Ladies Luncheon I went to last Friday. Excellent. Um, so I had the pleasure of attending that, and there was, I don't know, maybe 50 people in, in the room. Um, I think it was organised by um, Natalie O'Connell, former councillor and mayor. Um, there was also Jackie Felgate and Loretta. Oh, right now, I can't remember the last name. Works for Telstra. That's horrible. I should have written it down. Williton. Um, and I can't describe how amazing it was. At first, I was tempted to not go because I knew I had to do the opening speech and I felt really intimidated being by these powerful women and I thought, oh, no, there's no way I can do that. But I sucked it up and I got out there and um, it was just... It was probably my favourite event I've attended with council. Um, just meeting people in the high country, I had a chance to talk to people from Benambra and Omeo um, and it really informed me, I guess, what, what they're still missing with the emphasis currently on, on floods and, and everything else that's happening, we can't forget that there are still people recovering from bushfire recovery. Um, but it was, a, it was just a way to celebrate International Women's Day. And it was funny, every, like all the waiters were all men um, and all the women in the room were getting spoiled by a lot of men. So it was really fantastic to be there. Um, and I didn't actually send a report to Vanessa. Um, that's my bad, so I will try to get that in a minute, so I'll send a few other notes. But I was really happy to be there, and I hope that becomes an annual event. I don't think it will be free next time, but I think they're planning on running it each year. This time they got a council grant to run it. So. Great. Good on you. They would have loved you being there. Well done, okay. Kirsten. <laughs> Councillor White. If I can speed this up. Um, other than the normal mundane, taking phone calls, etc., and trying to sort other people's problems, which is what we're here for, um, I have nothing more to report. Thanks, John. We wax and wane in what we do. There's no doubt about it. Councillor Yuri. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had lots on in the last few weeks, it seems, but I just want to speak uh, very briefly about uh, a few of them. Firstly, in the same week of the floods in Queensland and New South Wales, there was the release of the sixth IPCC assessment report which once again highlighted the closing window of opportunity and the urgency of the need for rapid change if we, were to, if we are to avert the, need, the worst of the um, global heating and um, the results thereof. So the floods in Queensland and New South Wales were a, a shocking reminder, I think, of what climate change um, not will look like, but actually does look like as it um, increases the severity of those events. Um, so that's been a really uh, powerful lesson for me in the last few weeks. 
I think um, that we need to increase the urgency of, of our, and rapidly change in a number of ways. But we also need to develop a positive narrative of change too, so that we can move towards much more towards self-reliance. So this ties up, I think, with the emergency response that Councillor Greeson is obviously very conserved, um, concerned about. Um, we need to be more self-reliant, particularly with fuel, and we need to move quickly towards an, a system of uh, where we're relying on electric vehicles and more local food um, security. So that was the, um, the climate change one. I just wanted to mention how wonderful I think land care is. Not only do we have the morning in the mist at Tambo Bluff, um, but we also had the... Um, the Orbos show, which uh, Councillor Cook has already mentioned. And um, there was a great council presence there too, which I really enjoyed, as well as all the sustainability um, um, uh, caravans and so on. Council particularly promoting a new program, which I hadn't heard of, called Get Grubby. So it was great to see them there. And just finally, something really lovely happened on Sunday the 13th of March. The Gippsland Agricultural Group invited members of the public to go out to the air airport and pick... Sunflowers. fill of sunflowers. <laughs> what an awesome thing to do. So yep. we were out there and came away with some lovely armfuls of sunflowers to keep and to give away. So I thought that was Great. a beautiful gesture. What is it about sunflowers that make you smile? There's something yeah, about them. they do. Yep. They, they do. do. Councillor Buckley. Uh, so firstly, I just want to uh, thank community um, and friends and family for the support that we've recently received in regards to my father's sad passing. So that's kept me away from my, my councillor duties for a period of time, and I do apologise for community no. in regards to that. But Understandably then so. I'm, yeah. Um, so he was, his farewell was incredibly well attended, and... There was um, there were a, uh, a display of um, of big um, dromedary uh, agricultural um, planes that flew over the the funeral service, which was was quite astounding. And and uh, so we gave him an incredible farewell. And then, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the um, International Women's Day in Omeo because I became infected with COVID. Um, so my journey of healing has has um, been a bit of a, a, an extended one, and thankfully I've been able to um, start to heal from from having COVID and build natural immunity. So I'm I'm also i um, very happy to report that I should be back on full full duties hopefully by next week. So um, I just thank my colleagues for having patience in regards to that. And so, other than that, I have nothing more to report. No, good on you. No worries. Get well. Wish you well on that journey. Councillors, it's been a really busy um, couple of weeks from the mayoral's chair. I've been from one end of the town to the other, it seems. Apart from the, the couple of uh, events that other councillors have, uh, have mentioned, I'll just mention the Gippsland Tourism Conference at Lake Tyres, the Waterwheel Tavern, Ag Sector Advisory Committee Field Day was terrific. That's a great committee, that one. I, I really admire them. Tambo Bluff Landcare has been mentioned. Uh, Youth Ambassadors have been mentioned. Um, the Marlow Residents and Ratepayers have got a significant grant to do some street art installations, and they're using sculptures, sculptures, Maddie from Swifts Creek and Jeff from up at Kaya. If you know Kaya store, they're right across the border. Um, so they're doing some great work working with the community. I'm excited to see that. I went down to Lake Sentinels. Leader have done an amazing job in obtaining funding to revitalise the Cunningham Arm to Flagstaff Jetty Walk. So well done, Leader. Um, it's good to see um, the Audit and Risk Committee being revitalised. So that's that's a, a great piece of work on behalf of the members around the table and officers to um, have a full complement of Audit and Risk Committee members. Um, GCLP, Gippsland Community Leadership Program, one of my favourites and it was wonderful to go to their graduation and to see Angus and Meg, two of our staff, who are, mem uh, who are participants this year, and I can't wait to see their community projects that they'll, they'll uh, implement. And, of course, um, we were out at Peachtree Tamboon for the Fire Guard Shed opening, which is just an amazing 
piece of community work. Well done them out there, it's just incredible. How they got two seven metre trucks of concrete from Lakes Entrance out there and poured without them sitting hard as a rock, I don't know, but um, John O managed to do it somehow. Um, International Women's Day was fantastic and if you haven't seen on the councillor portal the Break the Bias video clip with some of your comments and some of the Shire officers' comments, it's really worth having a look at. So that's a great piece of work from the comms unit to, to capture that and, and put it together, Anthony. So congratulations them. And congratulations to the Shire for investing in and supporting the film and Pam Hammond. Um, we know how that was um, so well attended and appreciated. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is uh, the Parks and Garden team always astound us. And, and I think the Aboriginal flag flower bed in Main Street and the surf life saving cap flower bed in Meyer Street. Uh, just fantastic. How creative and fun are they? And it's a real, real credit. You know, we, all we seem to hear of in the last six months is when are they going to mow the lawn? Well, turn around and look at the gardens and just celebrate what a great piece of work they've done. So, councillors, uh, oh, oh, how could I forget the uh, Orbost Agricultural Sh Society show yesterday? That was hugely attended. So well done, councillors, on all the work that you do. You're busy, you're out in the community, you're advocating for your community, and don't underestimate even the small things you do by answering phones or answering emails. That's what makes you great councillors. So I'll um, shoot that report in to Vanessa, who always hounds me over the next couple of days for not getting it in on time, but I promise I will. Let's move on to item five, councillors, which are officers' reports. And uh, that is going to be... Uh, business excellence, and this is the finance report ending, period ending 31st of December. Peter. Thank, thank you, Mayor, and through you, Mayor. Um, councillors, before you tonight is a report titled the finance report for the period ending 31st of December 2021, which is seeking to adopt the finance report for the six-month period, as outlined in the attachments to the report, numbered one through to seven, Key points for you to consider tonight, tonight councillors, is that the Local Government Act 2020 requires a quarterly budget report to be presented to council detailing the financial performance to date against budget, that the forecast operating surplus is $22.24 million compared with the adopted budget operating surplus of $35.73 million. The forecast reduction in operating surplus of 13.3 that $13.49 million is primarily the result of $8.2 million of expenditure added to the forecast result, again, primarily due to the grant-funded projects that were incomplete at the end of the financial year 2020-21. These projects received funding in 2021, but the works will be completed in the 21-22 financial year. There's also a forecast reduction in capital grant income of approximately $10.2 million as a result of some capital projects now being planned for completion in the financial year period 2022-23. Also to note is an increase in uh, new or amended operating grants of $6.1 million, uh, which, is added, which has been added to both the income and expenditure line. So this um, value does not impact on the forecast surplus. There's been a forecast increase in the reimbursement income for the bushfire event uh, of a value uh, in the order of $4.6 million for works that were undertaken in the previous financial year. Council's end of year cash position is forecast to be $17.55 million, greater than the adopted budget as a result of the actual result at the end of the 20. 20 slash 21 financial year, which uh, was not known at the time of adopting the budget, together with $8.6 million approximately of cash that will now be held at year end for capital projects that will now be completed in the 22-23 financial year. In addition, you will note, councillors, that the Local Government Act 2020 requires that the second quarterly report of a financial year, that is the period ending 31 December 21, uh, must include a statement by the Chief Executive Officer as to whether a revised budget is or may be required. You will note in, the rec in one of the recommendations, councillors, that the Chief Executive Officer has declared that a revised budget will not be required. 
Also present tonight is the Manager of Finance, Liz Collins, who is available to respond to any questions of a technical nature. Councillors, the report and recommendations are presented to you for your consideration. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr Canizzaro. Yeah. Councillors, questions, comments, clarifications? Councillor Yuri. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, Mr Canizzaro, I know this, this report has been to audit and risk um, already, been seen by them, and I recall one of the questions that was asked in that forum was um, what what are the triggers which might require a new, uh, a new budget to be done by the CEO? I've actually forgotten. I wondered if you could please reiterate. A genuine question. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't a Dorothy Dixer. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Hello, Liz. Uh, good evening, councillors. Thank you, Councillor Yuri, for that question. In the Local Government Act 2020, there's three reasons that a revised budget um, would be determined. One is if there had to be a variation to the declared rates and charges. Mm -hmm. Two, if there were loan borrowings proposed that had not been included in the adopted budget. Mm -hmm. And the third one, which is more discretionary, is if the matter was so significant in terms of the dollars and whatever the project is, that the council believed that it needed to undertake a new community deliberative or engagement process with the community if it was so major or material. And so those three um, other factors that you need to consider. Um, but just to follow up, that third um, parameter, I suppose, there are no specific guidelines for that, for the, what constitutes such a major uh, adjustment. No, that so that, that's the, the one that would obviously take some further, you know, works discussions, but it would have to be something material and major for it to impact um, that significantly that you would go through at this time of yeah. year a revised budget. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. I've written down the answer this time. Thanks. Mr. That's right. There's three three reasons, and that's a good reason why I've forgotten them. So thank you, Liz, Don't for containing you. and retaining that knowledge. It's important. Councillor Stowe. Liz, I note that we have um, cash held of $96 million. Um, it's a pity we couldn't invest that at 10% like we used to a year or two back. Yeah. But um, my question is, um, could you just give us a brief outline of uh, what, where that money came from and what we're doing with it? Thank you, Councillor, for that question. We receive a, um, a lot of grants in advance of when we spend them, um, both capital and operating grants. So partly it is uh, that. Also, when we raise the rates, obviously we're raising money and receiving cash as we go along for those rate payments. Um, a significant um, contribution into our capital program is council cash. And depending on the timing of, of those works, there certainly may be council cash that has been raised for those works that will be spent later in the year or potentially some of it carried over into the next year if that project has moved up across into the, the next year. So um, it's certainly not unusual at this time of year for the council cash to be quite high. So um, it's, it's not unusual. And finally, could I just ask you if you may care to comment about the surplus? Um, uh, sorry, the surplus is $17 million over budget. I, th I think that with the, the surplus pr forecast is um, a reduction in the adopted budget for the um, surplus forecast for year end. And as a result of those many factors that Mr Canizzaro spoke about, from the timing of grants um, to works that it completed this year, which we received funding last year primarily. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Trevor. Councillor Crook. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Liz. Um, I, I notice we have some unfavourable variants 
uh, due to reduction in user charges primarily resulting from COVID closures, um, specifically through the Forge Creek facility, uh, theatre facility, Banter Recreation Aquatic Centre, uh, various caravan parks of totaling just over $600,000. Um, do we have enough in reserve to cover those losses or will we be duly compensated somehow or how are we going to manage that? Thank you, Councillor. For uh, those types of activities, there are some reductions in expenditure also for those periods where those facilities were closed and we were unable to provide those services, whether they be Forge Theatre, the recreation centres um, or caravan parks. And yes, we have been able to um, cover those with, um, um, there's been some areas where there's been some additional fees you would have noted through the planning area, for example, and a couple of other areas. So um, whilst there may be a small negative impact on those with the reduction in expenditure plus the additional revenue, then absolutely it is um, all able to be covered. Thank you. Councillor Crook. Councillors, any further questions, comments, clarifications? Okay, then, councillors, there is a recommendation. Is there a motion? Thanks, Councillor Stowe. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Crook, thank you. Councillor Stowe, would you like to speak to the motion? Well, just to say, I think our finances are very sound in very capable hands. Yep, and thanks for your questions clarifying that. Councillor Crook, no? Is the motion opposed? Anybody else like to speak for or against the motion? In which case, I'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 5.1.2 is a sale of land at Tambo Bluff Estate. And, Peter, this looks like you again. Mr Canizaro. Thank, thank you, Mayor, and through you, Mayor. Councillors, before you report... Thanks, Liz. ...titled Sale of Land, Tambo Bluff Estate, which is seeking to sell three parcels of land uh, within the Tambo Bluff estate. Key points of the report, councillors, for you to consider are that the restructure processes have, have been undertaken for decades to address several legacy issues within the Tambo Bluff estate. Um, the council officers undertook a review of, of the progress with the restructure pro process in 2020. A detailed assessment was undertaken of all properties in the Tambo Bluff estate that have not been able to be developed or consolidated due to site constraints, ownership patterns or inappropriate layouts. And, and, I've, and I have identified three council-owned properties that are readily available to be sold on the market. Um, so there are three properties, councillors, that uh, are contained within the report. Uh, three, Gannett Grove at Meetung, six, Kookaburra Avenue, Meetung, and 13, Curlew Grove at Meetung. The details of the um, square metres are contained within the report with Gannett Grove at 450 square metres, 6 Kookaburra Avenue at Meetung at about 929 square metres and 13 Curlew Grove Meetung at a large parcel of land of 1,756 square metres. Councillors, uh, the, uh, with me tonight is Ree Kent, Manager of Governance, who is available also to respond to any of the technical questions you may have. So the report councillors and the recommendations are presented to you tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Mr Canizaro, thank you. Councillors, questions, comments, clarification. Councillor White. Thank you. Um, 13 Curlew Grove is two blocks that you want to join end on end, but they both uh, measure almost um, 900 square metres, why couldn't you build on each of them at, at 900 square metres when we, we are actually building on blocks of 400 square metres now? Certainly. Thank, thank you, Councillor White, and through, through you, Mayor. Yeah. Um, so what, what we have done is, um, in accordance with the Tambo Bluff restructure uh, plan of 2018, is consolidated the two to make them a more saleable uh, parcel of land. Um, yeah, but that's two blocks end on end. I does, don't think that actually looks at, attractive and I'm thinking why couldn't you build on each of those blocks at 900 square metres? Each. Um, 
the response to that council of right is is that it is they are skinny blocks um, in my view and the parcel of land which is about as i said 1700 odd square meters is a more saleable piece of land any other questions councillors none that i can see councillors there's a recommendation is there a motion councillor allen thank you is there a seconder councillor greeson councillor allen would you like to speak to the motion uh, only that I think it's good that from time to time uh, council does an audit of what is surplus to our requirements and uh, apart from allowing the opportunity for someone to consolidate, uh, is it Gannett Grove? Yep. The other two uh, parcels of land are uh, an opportunity for someone to build a house. Uh, so I think that it's... Uh, and a shed. Yeah. So I, I support the motion. Good on you. Thanks, councillor. Councillor Greeson, is the motion opposed, councillors? Would anybody else like to speak for or against the motion? None that I can see. Councillors, I'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, CEO. Thank you, councillors. We're moving on to item 5.1.3, Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly Notices of motion. Mr. Canazaro, it's your night. It is. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, and through you. Councillors, before you is a report on proposed motions for this year's Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly, uh, which is going to be held on the uh, 19th through to the 22nd of June 2022. The theme of the National General Assembly is Partners in Progress. Um, before you tonight, uh, two recommendations that we um, have before you that are aligned with several of the topics underpinning the theme which have been listed in the report. The first motion seeks to continue the local roads and community infrastructure program in an ongoing capacity or develop a similar non-competitive program. On the basis that although this program has been beneficial for council, its lifespan is short Hence, the proposed motion to retain it or develop a similar scheme. Motion two seeks to expand the scope, reduce the evidence required and implement a fairer and more consistent process across all states in Australia for seeking funding under the disaster relief funding arrangements. As it stands, this scheme creates several issues for councils, namely the scope, which include, excludes things such as removal of debris. And also there are um, quite onerous and strong evidentiary requirements in the claims process. If approved tonight, these motions will proceed to submission uh, to the um, ALGA, the Australian Local Government Association, by the 25th of March, uh, so they can be compiled for the um, June meeting of the 19th through the 22nd of June. Um, tonight with me uh, are my colleagues, uh, Fiona Weigel, General Manager of Assets and Environment, and Stuart McConnell, uh, General Manager, Manager of Place and Community, who may respond to some of your questions as these motions do directly relate to their field of expertise. So the report and recommendations, councillors, is presented to you tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Good on you. Thanks, Mr. Canazaro. Councillors, questions, comments, clarifications? Two motions recommended there. None that I can see. Councillors, there is a recommendation. Is there a motion? It's not going to lapse, is it? Thank you, Councillor Van Diggle. A seconder. Councillor Crook. Councillor Van Diggle, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, not really. I've, I've, I've read them and I think they're really important. So, great. Nothing really to add. <laughs> Thank you. Good as that. Thank you. Councillor Crook. Uh, simply that these will just allow us um, to access further funding streams for disaster recovery in particular. Um, we all know that the last disaster that we had won't be our last disaster. And it's really important that we are able to access these. 
um, opportunities in an ongoing way and, and also in a non-competitive way. We don't want these responses to natural disasters to be a grant writing competition when communities are in need. We need to be able to access funding opportunities like this when they're needed. Hmm. Um, and I believe these motions will go some way to ensuring that we can do that. Thanks, Councillor. Is the motion opposed, Councillors? Would anybody else like to speak for or against the motion? I'll just add that, Councillors, I think just given what's happened to our cousins and friends in northern New South Wales and Queensland, anything we can do around disaster relief funding arrangements that, um, that eases the pain and, and difficulty for those, those communities, and we've been part of that, but what we're seeing up there in terms of the incredible clean-up afterwards and um, the challenges that they're facing, that I think that this is something, a small thing that we can do as well to advocate for our communities up there. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when there's another disaster. So I'm very happy to support this. So councillors, I'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? Thanks, councillors. Carried unanimously, see you. Uh, we're on to item 5.2, councillors. And that is the planning application, 5.2.1, uh, planning application 476 2021 P uh, 27 Eagle Point Road, Eagle Point Multi-Lot Subdivision. And this is one we've seen before and is subject to a planning consultation meeting. But we've got um, Mr Pringle there with us as well. And Mr McConnell, are you going to take it away or? Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, councillors, before you use the report, regarding a proposed subdivision of land at 27 Eagle Point Road, Eagle Point. The land zoned general residential land is within the area covered by the Eagle Point structure plan, which was prepared with substantial public consultation and adopted by council in 2019. And the officer's recommendation is that a planning permit uh, is approved, subject to the conditions outlined in the report. A couple of things to draw to your attention. Uh, firstly, the proposal lines strongly with the preferred development of the site and locality as set out in the Eagle Point structure plan. Um, a planning consultation meeting was held, as outlined by the Mayor, where objectors' concerns were raised, and those concerns have been considered and addressed uh, in the recommendation. In particular, there's a large old tree in the centre of the site, which is now proposed to be protected in a public reserve. Um, con also, construction of Riley Street will be undertaken to meet the requirements of the structure plan and the infrastructure design manual with curb and channel and vehicle crossovers to the frontage lots. So they're the lots in the new development. And the street will be constructed to meet the capacity stands for a local access place as outlined in the infrastructure design manual. So, so whilst widening of the road reserve or the land set aside for the road is not required, the pavement width may be increased uh, to meet the infrastructure design manual requirements for a 5.5 metre wide pavement. So the requirements in relation to road, the road design are, are clear in the design manual. A detailed stormwater management plan will be required to ensure that surface water flows from the site are not increased to the detriment of the downstream properties or waterways. And a section 173 agreement is proposed to require that no further subdivision of the land will occur to create additional lots. The, propo the proposal is consistent with the planning scheme requirements and the development outcomes envisaged in the the Eagle Point Structure Plan, and the recommendation is that Council resolves to issue a notice of decision to grant a planning permit subject to the permit conditions at Attachment 1. Now, at this point, I need to just briefly draw to your attention a minor change in the officer recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, we have noted an administrative error uh, that's resulted in a, one of the conditions in the Attachment 1 being retained, which should have been deleted. And so uh, this relates to the provision of um, financial contribution in lieu of open space, which is included in error. And so the, op the revised office officer recommendation uh, deletes condition five and then proposes the remaining conditions be renumbered accordingly. Um, and if, and if uh, councillors wish, um, Vanessa can show that to you on the screen. Yeah, thanks, Mr. McConnell. So, condition five, public open space contribution. Is that what you're referring to? That's the one. And that's changing to? So that, that condition is simply deleted. Deleted entirely. And then, and then the other 
the other uh, conditions are just renumbered accordingly. Okay. So, um, and as you outlined, uh, Robert Pringle and Martin uh, Richardson are here to assist with any questions, should you have any. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, there's a few questions. Councillor Crook, then Councillor Stowe. Councillor Stowe, go ahead. Thank you. Martin, the question to you, um, there's been some um, uh, discussion about the drainage, stormwater drainage from the estate. Can you give us an assurance that that is adequately met? Thank you, Councillor Stowe. And through you, Mayor, uh, we have had discussions subsequent to the planning consultation meeting and certainly uh, residents in the area were concerned about drainage issues. We've had discussions with the Catchment Management Authority and have drafted conditions of approval accordingly. So importantly, there's a condition of approval in there which says that uh, the detailed stormwater management plan, which is a requirement of the condition, must demonstrate that downstream flows from this property will not adversely impact uh, either private property or downstream waterways. Now, this can get a bit complex, but basically there's about a hectare of open space at the bottom end of the subdivision, which is designed to accommodate stormwater detention and to assist in the, re in the uh, retention of stormwater flows in rain events. So that condition places an onus on the applicant to provide a detailed stormwater management plan, which will be approved by the East Gippsland Catchment Management Authority and is required to demonstrate that stormwater flows resulting from this development will not be greater in volume or greater in velocity than those that are already experienced. So basically, in a nutshell, there are conditions recommended in the uh, officer's recommendation that will assure that uh, stormwater management can be met. And if those requirements cannot be met, then um, we won't sign off on a certificate of compliance for the subdivision. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Crook. Uh, thank you. Just further to those same concerns, the area proposed for stormwater retention uh, down in the south eastern corner, is it? Uh, that, that contains what appears to be a lot of trees. Will that retention area then need to be cleared of that vegetation to, to install those structures, or are they able to be implemented without that vegetation loss? Thanks, Councillor Crook, and through you, Mayor, no, the uh, vegetation within that area will be retained. Um, so it's up to the applicant to demonstrate through the stormwater management plan that both the vegetation will be retained and the detention will be implemented. Uh, that is possible. There's about a hectare of land there, so it's, it's a su sufficient size of land to accommodate both the existing vegetation and the stormwater detention. And importantly, there is also a condition requiring the maintenance of that area for a period um, before council takes it over as, a, as an asset owned by council. So both uh, Councillor Cook and Tria Mayor, the vegetation will be retained and the stormwater detention will be designed around the vegetation. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr Richardson. Uh, I just have another question. We, we've had some um, commentary and a question from the residents of Riley Street um, earlier today and, and previously, I believe, in the, the consultations uh, are around concerns that providing access to the, the Riley Street there will allow people to take a shortcut um, and potentially increase traffic volumes uh, that, that will put public safety at risk. Um, that sounds quite concerning. Um, what are we doing to ensure that that's not, in fact, the case? Thanks, Councillor. And through you, Mayor, the connection to Riley Street is considered as important. It was included in the Eagle Point Structure Plan. And the reason for that is that there's a sort of a philosophy in traffic management that traffic should be distributed to various locations, depending on which way people are driving. The reality is that um, Riley Street currently provides access to, I think, about a dozen properties, and there's another eight proposed in this subdivision that will uh, have direct access to Riley Street. That's still a, a relative small, relatively small number of properties. Yes, uh, this subdivision will have access to Riley Street, but it will be constructed to a, a local access street, so reduced speed limits, uh, you know, reduced design for speed limits. Um, and given the traffic modelling indicates that most of the traffic leaving this subdivision will go directly to Eagle Point Road, 
because that will take you directly to the Painesville Bairnsdale Road. Um, the traffic modelling indicates that Riley Street is very unlikely to attract shortcuts, for want of a better word. Um, however, someone in this living in this area uh, who wishes to visit a friend in Bay Road will find it more convenient to travel via Riley Street. The prediction is that uh, this subdivision will generate 300 or less vehicle movements per day in Riley Street. That's a very small number indeed. That's you know, less than 20 an hour. Um, and so what we have here is a, is a subdivision which provides good connectivity to the surrounding area, but most of the traffic in this subdivision will be generated back to Eagle Point Road um, and onto the Painesville Bairnstow Road. So we're confident that the connection to Riley Street will both provide a convenient route for locals who wish to travel amongst Eagle Point, but won't provide a shortcut because it's, it's simply not going to be convenient for people to drive, let's say, from Bay Road up Riley Street through the subdivision onto Painesville Road when they can scoot around past the school and up Eagle Point Road. OK, thank you. And just one further point of clarification. Mm -hmm. There's been some concern um, around the potential loss of a remnant tree, a large, large eucalypt in the middle of the development. Um, I'm right in thinking that that will now be retained? Thank you, Councillor. And through you, <coughs> Mayor. Yep. Uh, yes, there's been discussion with the applicant about the tree. The council's arborist has inspected the tree, and yes, it is a significant tree. Uh, so there are conditions recommended in the officer's recommendation that uh, a couple of lots are reoriented. The tree is retained within a corner lot, which is to become a municipal reserve, and therefore the tree will uh, be preserved within a council reserve. Um, and that is to respond directly to the communities and others' concerns about the tree. So the recommendation is that that tree will be preserved within a um, council reserve. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Crook. Councillor Greeson, then Councillor Urey. This isn't a question, this is just a statement. I just want to commend the proponent and also Martin and your staff in, um, in uh, being able to protect that tree and create the space around it to protect it uh, and, pr and create that little reserve in the middle. I think it's an excellent outcome. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Councillor Urey. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just returning to Riley Street, <coughs> sorry, and just because there's been quite a bit of concern about that, I note that um, it will be, or the, the pavement will be widened from what it is currently, but the road itself won't, but that we're confident then that that road will cater for the traffic that we anticipate, also the backing out of um, from blocks along Riley Street and parking on the side of the street as well. Would that be true? Thank you, Councillor, and through you, Mayor. I've been to Riley Street yep. twice in the last two days to have a look. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so Riley Street is relatively narrow and the left-hand side, sorry, when you're travelling up, the southern side is basically not constructed. So there's no curb and channel on the southern side and there's a reasonably steep embankment against the proposed subdivision. So I spoke to the applicant this morning. We have a condition in the recommended, in the officer's recommendation that requires the upgrading of roads as required. So that's a kind of a catch-all. So what will happen is that um, there will be curb and channel constructed on the southern side of Riley Street. The pavement will be widened if necessary to achieve the 5.5 metre width, which is uh, absolutely su sufficient for vehicles to pass each other. Um, and under the infrastructure design manual, uh, it's a requirement that there will be verge parking on every, at least every, in the verge for at least every second residential property. So again, bearing in mind that I think we have about 12 properties on the right-hand side as you're going west and about another eight on the left-hand side, um, then there will be sufficient width for vehicles to reverse into the street, into what will be a very quiet street. And also the proponent um, uh, reminded me this morning that the intention is to, um, to reconfigure the topography because, as I said, there's a reasonably steep embankment. So those lots will be, um, will be reconfigured um, so that crossovers are provided into the new frontage allotments. 
and therefore um, vehicles visiting those neighbours will be able to park in the driveway, but there will be sufficient space in the street for one vehicle for every two properties to actually park in the street. Fantastic. I think that will give uh, a lot of comfort to those residents. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. I just had a further question, please, about that um, condition number five. Could I have some more understanding about why that's being removed, please? Two words, Councillor. Thank you, Mayor. Administrative error. Um, so we have a standard condition when, for example, we have a subdivision that doesn't provide open space, public open space, we have a standard condition as per the Act, uh -huh. which requires a percentage payment of cash to Council to provide facilities in the joining open space in the locality. In this case, we have about one hectare of open space contributed to the development, uh, that is in the south eastern corner, and we've also got this proposed um, public reserve around the, the tree. So it was simply an error on my part um, not to delete the standard condition, which says if you don't provide open space, then you provide cash. Yep. So the reason for that is we can't double up. They've provided a, you know, a significant amount of open space in this development. And of course, under the Act, we can't be doubling up and requiring cash as well. So simple error. We learn by our mistakes and sometimes we pick them up in time. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Martin. Councillor Erie, great. Councillor White. Thank you. Um, Martin, Hoskin Street, that reserve actually goes from, from Tate Street through to Eagle Point Road, but of course at this stage it's, um, it's a dead end at the end of those houses. Is it, will it always remain as such and never be, never be opened up because then it would encroach on a lot of that vegetation? Thanks, Councillor, and through you, Mayor. Yes, both Hoskin Street and the western end of Riley Street um, suffer from the planning predicament known as too much planning too early. You create a road reserve and then 50 years later, there's a whole lot of trees growing in it. Um, so yes, Hoskin Street, you know, as are many of the streets in Eagle Point, some significant red gum um, remnant vegetation. And Riley Street, similarly, there's at least one significant tree in that road reserve. So Hoskin Street and the western end of Riley Street should never be developed as a road because they contain vegetation which contributes significantly to the character of Eagle Point. And we have sufficient road intersections and access in this subdivision to, to cater for the traffic generation. Um, and thus those road reserves won't ever need to be developed for traffic. They can be retained for trees and cockatoos and people. Very good, they'll enjoy them. Councillor Crook. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks. Just in relation to Hoskin Street there, there's currently a really significant weed load of African box thorn, which I've been observing for uh, some years. Is that actually a council road and they're in those uh, weeds our responsibility or is that a Vic Roads or a Rural Roads matter? Thanks, Councillor. And through you, Mayor, yes, I fear to say it is the council's issue. Um, and one of the benefits of development is that um, the council will need to address some of these issues now as residents move into the area and will no doubt expect uh, management of these reserves, which previously have been, you know, just sitting there. Um, I would suggest that as a result of development, should it be approved, that then there will be some attention given by uh, the council's open space staff and others to the management of weeds. We'll probably employ the assistance of the Eagle Point Land Care Group, I would suggest as well. Um, and there will be some effort need to be put in to the management of weeds in those reserves, um, which again is one of the positives that comes out of, of development is that there can then be resources put into management of um, those environmental assets. I look forward to that progressing. Very good, thanks Councillor Cook. Martin, I just have a question, it's more an observation and I know in the conditions, it does privilege that block with the tree that has been mentioned, but the diagrams and figures in the report still don't reflect that. They still reflect the old original plan. That's correct, yep. uh, Mayor. Um, so we have had further discussions with the applicant since the planning consultation meeting. Yep. The applicant offered 
the um, the um, retention of the tree in a reserve. Um, we didn't go down the path of requiring amended plans, etc., because that would have led us down another couple of months of, of process. But what the applicant has offered to the council, and it's in writing, is that um, that condition is acceptable. And thus, um, I hope it's reasonably clear, if you refer to the, um, the diagram in the report, that there are two lots to be reoriented, basically yep. uh, switched around by 90 degrees, if my geometry works correctly, yes, 90 degrees, and the corner allotment to be retained as a reserve. Yep, okay, <coughs> they'd be blocks 38 and 39 on the existing. MRT That's road. correct, and Robert's the corner nodding, block so great. Corner Good. block would retain the tree. That's important that uh, we're all on the same page around that one. Any further questions, councillors? Thanks for the explanation, officers. That's appreciated. So there is a recommendation there, councillors. Is there a motion? I can see Councillor Stowe, thank you. Councillor Allen, Councillor Stowe, would you like to speak to the matter? Yes, thank you. <coughs> Look, uh, this um, subdivision is in a residential zone already, surrounded by the housing developments. There's 75 allotments, and they range from 797 to 1,019 square metres, so they average about 900, which is a good size block. It's a zone that's been long established for development, the community were consulted in the structure plan. We've been assured by uh, Martin that the drainage exceeds the regulations, the trees have been protected, and I see no reason not to support the officer's recommendation. Very good. Thank you. Well said. Councillor Allen. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, I had two concerns originally, which was the drainage and the retention of the trees, and uh, both those issues have been satisfactorily addressed, so I support the motion. Great, thank you. Thank you, councillors. Is the motion opposed? <coughs> Would anybody else like to speak for or against the motion? Councillor Urey. Uh, thank you. Just in support of the motion, Mr Mayor, um, we've, there's been a lot of work. There's always a lot of work going to these big proposals mm. by our officers, but this has been the subject of a lot of discussion around the council table as well, and I think a lot of people have um, worked very hard to try and get the best possible outcome This is for this uh, subdivision. It's a major uh, development for Eagle Point. It's a prime location in Eagle Point. Um, and the, I, I'd, I'd also like to commend the, the officers and the proponent in being willing to make um, some cha changes to accommodate some of the concerns that have been heard from the community. Um, I look forward to meeting the people who who live here. I think they'll enjoy living in Eagle Point. All those connections with um, the beautiful bushland and open spaces around Eagle Point will be there for, for these people to enjoy, including the development on the foreshore at Eagle Point. I think it'll be, it'll be a terrific place to live. Yep, Happy to support on. it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Anybody else like to speak for or against the motion? I'd just like to say that ha having been on Council for a little while and being party to the original consultation around the structure plan to see the realisation of this development now, um, as after several years of um, that structure plan and the last council group moving that, that uh, structure plan and seeing it in place now, it's really reassuring. Uh, Eagle Point will be a, just a, an absolutely beautiful place to live. These will be sought after blocks and with our development down in the foreshore there, highly desirable. So lucky you who live there and those new people who do so. So on that note, councillors, I'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? Thanks, councillors. Carried unanimously. Councillors, the next section is uh, urgent and other business, and I don't think there is any. And then item seven is confidential business, and we need to move into, conf into camera. Yes, we do need a motion for that. Are you going to take us there, Councillor yes, Allen? I'll move that uh, we now move into confidential business. Is that sufficient, CEO? That's sufficient. Is there a seconder? Councillor Greeson, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Greeson, is the motion opposed? I'll put the motion to the vote that we move into camera. Carried unanimously, thank you. We are now in confidential.
we're online. Councillors, community members and those who are watching, thank you very much for being part of our council meeting tonight on Tuesday the 15th of March. As I said at the beginning, the Ides of March. Go and look up what that is if you don't know. Shakespearean. But Julius Caesar, he needs to be careful. And we look forward to seeing you, councillors and officers, at Buchan on April the 5th, I think it is. April the 5th? Early April, next council meeting in Buchan. So thank you very much, councillors, and thanks for your attendance. And, uh, and I hope to continuously improve this, and if there's in future that uh, community members have questions and you feel you'd like to answer them yourselves, please do that, and I'll make sure I allow that to happen.